Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Ecom Edge, the first e commerce podcast focused on how enterprise brands, manufacturers, and teams like yours can be smarter with data, technology, and resources to gain that very important competitive edge. Well, in addition to the personal toll, the pandemic has had such a negative effect on business and, in fact, continues today. But there is a bright spot, and that's the growth of direct to consumer selling. When the world shut down, manufacturers had to find online channels to keep revenue flowing, and it's turned out that D2C is here to stay. So I'm really excited to introduce my guest today. Mike Stevens is the author of the Direct-to-Consumer Playbook, and he tapped the minds of 16 prominent D2C brands to find out what worked and didn't and what didn't. Hey, Mike, thanks for joining us today. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. Great to have Great to be here. Great. I'm so happy to have you. Well, we're going to get in a minute, but um, let's dig into your background a little bit. So you were like the original ac- accidental D to C brand with Pepper Smith, weren't you? Uh, yeah, I guess so. I mean, we were. So just to, just to go back in my history, I um, co-founded a confectionery brand back in two thousand and nine, and this was way before um, sort of D to C was really a thing. But we always, from the get-go, we had a a funky little web shop, really basic, um, just one product with a PayPal button, and it enabled us to do um, e-commerce. So anyone who wanted to buy the product could from the website. However, being a confectionery brand, as you can imagine, most of our customers um, were B2B retailers. So we wanted to get our product on all the shelves at front of store. So we sold mints and chewing gum. So, you know, D2C, um, it wasn't a um, wasn't the focus at all. However, we had it. And the reason we had it is because we were doing some really, you know, some quite different stuff in the, in the, in the category. And we wanted to make sure anyone who heard about our brand, wherever they were in the country, in the UK, and to start with, were able to able to get hold of the products. Um, so we had this little web shop running. And um, what always surprised us is actually, you know, without really trying, the web shop from the get go was always a big thing. And especially we had, um, we were lucky, we had some really nice bits of PR. And especially in, um, we got a piece, or we were mentioned in the Daily Candy. And I don't know if you remember that newsletter, but back in the day, that was a big deal, right? So Daily Candy had you know, hundreds of thousands of uh, of people getting this newsletter telling them what's the hot new thing. And then all of a sudden, boom. We had just launched and we appeared. Um, so not only were we getting orders from the UK, we in fact we got orders from all over the world. Um, and we were so glad we had this little web shop churning out stuff. But yeah, as you say, it was really by accident. It was done um, just because we could and we thought we should. It wasn't done as a strategic um, uh, well, revenue. You were out of the and you were out of the country at the time that like this uh, thing hit, right? Well, no, that was one of that was even we had a few of these little events that, which really informed that D to C actually could be a big thing for us. So first of all, it was the Daily Candy, and we were happy. I was around then when with those emails started coming in. It's like, oh wow, this could be good. There was another event about a year later where in uh, the UK it was the it was the Times um, oh, newspaper, right. which you, you, you probably know and. And they, again, they um, they were highlighting the health benefits of a particular ingredient that we use. Uh, that was called xylitol. It's a natural sweetener. It's really good for your teeth. So um, the paper was talking about that. But they also name-checked us as a brand and a product as a great way of getting all the benefits. So, again, all of a sudden, we had all of these emails, all of these orders. And at that, at that moment in time, I was in uh, I was in Amsterdam. So I was at a, confe- um, a coffee show. So we were talking to Starbucks and all the sort of European coffee uh, houses and retailers trying to convince them that they should stock our products in their coffee shops. Um, but no, we were in the wrong place. We should have been home because our D2C channel was just going bonkers. So yes, we had to quickly jump back on the plane and uh, fulfill the orders. And at this time, the crazy thing was at that time, because it was so early and it, you know, again, D2C wasn't a big thing for us. We were doing all our D2C orders out of our little office. So, you know, we were putting, you know, ordering product from the warehouse and we were the ones putting them in boxes, sticking on the labels, writing the little notes. Um, and uh, yeah, when we got this, these, these nice bits of PR, 
it was like, wow, we could do, we couldn't do anything else other than, you know, stick labels on boxes and write little notes and go to the post office. So that was where we started in D2C. Uh, but yeah, it was really accidental because we didn't, you know, we didn't have any hopes that D2C would be a channel. However, it turned out it was. And so it was after a few years into the business, we thought, right, D2C is growing and we're not even trying. So, you know, we best make, make the most of it and actually figure out how to do it properly. Yeah, I, th- I think that's one of the things that's so fascinating about your story and the many stories that you have in, in the book is that you have these um, great ideas from founders. They're very excited about their product. Um, and and if you, you bring this up in your book over and over again, the, the importance of the brand, the importance of wanting to connect uh, to the consumer and, and convey the value of the brand and the value to the consumer. Um, of the brand. And, and that is one success model. And another one is like these large manufacturers just had their, their legs cut off literally when the pandemic struck and all the retail was shut down and they, they had to figure out how in the world do we keep any revenue coming in? Uh, your book really focuses on the first group, the digital natives, the, the, those that are going out there with a great idea. They want to know, you know, how can they go direct to consumer Maybe they want to get into retail as well, or maybe through some marketplaces. But you know, what, why don't we start there? Why don't we talk about that end of it and and why that was so intriguing to you? Yeah. So yeah, I mean, the book is about um, purely direct to consumer brands. But what you will find if you read the book or talk to pretty much any direct to consumer brand um, today, you start direct to consumer, but then um, multi channel and omni channel becomes a thing. Uh, and that's because you realize not, you know, even if you've got the best direct to consumer marketing channel, you've got the best website, you've got the best Instagram account, whatever it is, there's still some people who don't want to buy digitally. They want to look, they want to feel, they want to touch, they want to experience your products in real life. And so you, with those people, it's like if you're not in the places where you can interact with them in real life, you're going to lose those sales. So this is why you know most brands um, sort of look to multi-channel eventually. However, direct-to-consumer is just such a brilliant way to launch any new brand. And the reason is you've already mentioned this, is that direct connection you can have with your consumer. And when you've got your, a direct connection, you can learn from them and they can learn from you. And by you learning from them, it means you can, uh, you know, refine your products and the way you interact with those customers to give them exactly what they want. And they can learn from you because unlike in a, in a store, they can talk to, you know, directly to, you know, whoever's making their products. They can find out what they want about the product, whether it's about the quality of the product or the provenance of the materials or the attitudes, you know, around you know, making. Is it about quality? Is it about sustainability? Is it about price? Whatever it is, you know, the, the, the end customer, the end user has this opportunity to interact directly with the producer and to double check, is is this the sort of product that I want? And then really importantly as well, into the, in today's age, it's like, you know, does this company share the same values as me? Does this company believe in the same things I believe in? And if there is a match, then you know you've got not only are you going to best convert a purchase, you're going to make it make a sale, but you've got a much better chance of um, that that customer you know coming back again and again. And even better than that, if you've really got this, uh, if you've really really done a job in the connection, not only are they going to buy from you again and again, they're also going to tell their friends, their family, they need to do the same. Right. Mike, it's funny, you you were rattling off like all of these things that you have to do. I mean, it's more than just coming up with a great product or a product line or product catalog. I mean, when you're going due to see, it's all of the operational aspects of, of getting it from that great idea in your head into the customer's house and, and everything in between. And, and I've got to imagine that not every company goes in with the same perspective. I mean, you're going to be really great at something and not so good in something else. Is that what you were picking up when you were interviewing all these different people? Yeah, and yeah, what it's like, this is this is like just business 101. Yeah, right. there's so much you have to do right at the same time for it to be successful. There's no good if you've just got, you know, you've got a great product but you haven't got a great supply chain or you know you've got, you know, you've got a brilliant price and, and but you've got no marketing channel you know you you have to do all of these things at the same time and i do this i mean at the moment i do a lot of consulting with you know sort of start up and scale up brands and it always surprises me in terms of you know the lack of understanding in terms of you have to get all these elements to work 
So you first you've got to have a great product, but then you've got to you know does that product does it does it make sense to be in market? Who's the rest of the competition out there? What are the alternatives? What are the pricing? And then you know you've got to do the operational stuff as you say. It's just your supply chain and D 2 C is actually quite hard in supply chain because unlike mm. B2C, retail you have to you know package up every single product and get that product to every single consumer you know and that's just a lot of lot of logistics whereas again if you're b2b selling to a retailer you're you know you're you know pallets or cages or whatever you're selling you just send that to a from one warehouse to another warehouse and the rest of it's all taken care of for you so yes there is a lot of things going on and but you know i'd say the founders all the founders that i interviewed you know they've got successful d2c businesses so they figured all this stuff out and yeah to survive they had to figure it out quite quickly if they didn't already know it so yeah they they knew but what was the great thing about the book is that Clearly, they all of the founders had, I guess, different strengths in terms of their um, product market fit or their actually their, their inherent skills in terms of the founder or the rest of the team. But they were all so passionate about serving the end customer. This is what it's about, you know. They knew who they wanted to serve, um, and they found out ways to serve them better and better and better. Well, there's one story that stuck out to me, um, possibly because I have a dog and I know you're allergic to them. So I took them out of the room for you because I knew you didn't. Need to. <laughs> um, it, it, and it's a cautionary tale. Uh, pardon the pun. Uh, tales. Uh, they were so good on the technology that they and they were looking at the data and they were but but they forgot to make that personal connection. They didn't have it easy for people to reach out to them, to talk to their community. And he admits it quite freely, which is really what I love about the book is that you're looking at it from all these different aspects and you have this honesty, this candor that comes out where they say, yeah, we really screwed up here. We needed to to make it easier for people to find us, to talk to us. And it's that one-to-one feedback, which really is the strength of D2C, right? I mean, uh, versus just getting a report from somebody, it's getting that uh, that that close touch, um, and and they had missed out on that in the beginning. And when they turned that around, the whole company took off. That, I mean, that's right. I mean, the tow, you know, towels dot com. Who they make pet food, they make dog food, and a, a brilliant story. I mean, what I would say uh, about that story because the um, James, the founder, he was very very honest with me in terms of what what happened and why it nearly went wrong and what they, all the things they did to to fix it and make it a, a brilliant business that it is today. Um, so, but the reason I guess all the founders in the book were so candid with me. I'm a founder myself, so exactly. uh, we were able to talk on a one to one level, and I think you know. Because because I was a founder, I was able to ask them questions that an academic or a journalist just wouldn't think of. It's like the real life questions. It's like, yeah, you know, how did you not get that thing to screw up? We all, you know, as a business owner, I know how hard it is. How did how did you get it right? And then the other thing that also happened as well. But again, being a business owner, I was able to translate their answers and go that next level, you know, ask the why and the why and the why again uh, to get some great answers. And in the case of, of James and Tales.com, yes, um, what happened was they um, they set up a brilliant, brilliant um operational business so they was able to make all this uh personalized dog food or dog foods fit for each and every single dog and they had this great factory manufacturing energy and engineering expertise brilliant website back ends and um, because they they had done it done before with some different products they knew exactly the, what they was doing but this is where the caution of towers and i think it'd be very useful to your enterprise or your bigger business um listeners is they forgot and that a D2C business is meant to provide this one-to-one connection. And by doing that, they have to uh, find out exactly what their customers want and their customers have to be able to connect with the brand and ask them questions and um, find out more information and potentially ask them to change and, and it, uh, uh, their, their service and their product to, you know, to suit their needs. And they forgot that part. And because they forgot that part, even though they um, they had they were set up brilliantly operationally and technically, um, they made one or two assumptions that were incorrect, and those there was one or two really really small uh, assumptions that weren't quite right because they weren't but could be because they weren't right. It was actually killing the business and their customers because they thought you know this is good but it's not that good. Their customers didn't like the product or didn't trust them. So it's only when they fix that. So not only by talking to the customers did they find out all the things they needed to fix, but also the customers actually started to trust them. It's like, oh right, you 
do understand what we need and you do care about us. And in, in the case, it's like, and you do care about the same things that we do, which was, yeah, their dog's well-being. So they had to do all those things to get it right. And once they did, the business was very successful. So, and I think this is, you know, it's a great point. So any of these, you know, uh, that sort of, or more traditional, bigger incumbent brands who got to the pandemic and thought, right, oh, we best start selling online because you know people can't can't go to the store or don't want to go to the store. Um, so let's start selling online. Unless they properly understood um, how what consumers want from a brand when they buy from them direct, it's going to feel a bit weird and not quite right and a bit like a big business trying to do something like a small business and that never works out very well. Yeah, but although interestingly, I was reading something from McKinsey and the World Federation Sporting Goods Industry, and they stated that sporting good brands should be striving to have at least 20% D to C at, at this point. Um, and I think it was Nike said that they hit, you know, 25%. So they, they've exceeded that. Well, well Nike, Nike is a great brand. I mean, they've really embraced D to C. Um, they you know, they want it as a real key channel, and what they've also done um, is actually they've started scaling down their relation to their B two B relationships to make sure they have got a stronger B two C channel to make sure when you go on the app or their website, you do get a great experience and you potentially get products that you can't do in store. Yeah, so this is a real strategic shift that um, someone like Nike has done, and I, but I agree. You know, other other sports, the sporting goods is, is great. So when you buy sporting goods, I guess if you're um, if you play a lot of sports, you know which brands you like, and you know what which equipment you need. Um, you don't need to go into store. I mean, I, I personally, I play a lot of tennis. I know which tennis racket brand I like, and I know what size it is. Um, I, I know what string tension I like and stuff. So it's actually quite. I can just jump online and buy what I need. Um, so D 2 C facilitates that, and also, you know, if I think about the, you know, my my tennis racket transactions, when I buy online, that um, <clears throat> that brand has now got my details, and they're able to connect with me when they've got something new that they think I might like or might benefit from. They can let me know. I don't have. To, they don't have to worry about me. Oh, when's the next time Mike going to go in the sporting store and see our new, our new version or our new equipment or a new promotion? They don't have to worry about that because you know trips to sporting goods stores. You definitely don't do them every week. It's not like um, not like grocery. So I think it's really beneficial to have that you know that interaction online. But you know it's funny. It's like twenty percent. You know. Is 20% right? Could it be more? It probably could be more. But again, it goes back to multi-channel is right because there are lots of people who are not sure what brand to buy or what you know what particular piece of equipment they need or they, they might want to have a chat with the um, the sales representative in store, all of those things. So going online doesn't suit everyone. And so if those sporting goods stores moved everything online, yeah, they would probably find you know, sales are going to go down quite quickly. Yeah, you, you were talking about um, in the in the book over and over again, and and again, Tails did a super job with this, with which is looking at the data and and the analytics. I mean, they, they missed out on on that one to one personal thing, but they as an aggregate, they were doing a super job with that. <clears throat> and that's one of the drivers that a lot of uh, folks that were traditional B two B or maybe traditional marketplace are saying, I want to go D to C now because I am not getting that data. I am not getting that rich consumer data. I don't know why they're using it. I don't know what else they're using it with. You know, you, you lose sight of that. Talk about that a little bit and, and what 100%. you gain. Yeah, hundred percent. You've, you, you've really got one of the most important messages out, out of the book I wrote. So data, data is, I mean, it's so rich, it's so abundant, but this, and it's the reason why pretty much every consumer brand um, should do at least some D to C even if it's, if it's only 5% of their revenue. And the reason is because they're, they're able to, again, connect directly with their customers. Um, they can find out exactly what those customers want. And this doesn't have to be um, sort of a, a conversation. You don't have to send them a questionnaire or send them um, uh, or pick up the phone or send them an email and, you know, and, and have a conversation with them. You can see from the data. You can see which products they're clicking on most on the website, what ranges. You can see how many people are coming back for more, uh, how many people are, are dropping off, how many people respond to price promotions. Um, yeah, all of the different variables that you have in terms of you thinking about marketing and promotion, you can test them and see in real time, um, yeah, is this going to be successful or not? And the great thing about it, because you see it in real time, if you see it working, 
you can double down on that. You can do more and more of it. And if you see, oh, it's not working, you you can either tweak or just stop or stop altogether. Which is you just couldn't do that. And you know, old school marketing when you like, you know, you paid for all your ads to appear in the newspaper on the TV or wherever. You know, you you were you were a lot. Um, you're just a lot slower to react. There's a there's a great quote um, in the book from uh, Hugh Thomas who ran the Ugly Drinks brand, and he said he did lots of um, sort of. Um, new variations online uh, before he launched them into store. And what he said, it was so powerful. He said he can learn more in a week from D to C data than he can from the product being in store for a year. Yeah, I, in fact, that's one. I wrote that down. And you also say overall a month in D to C in, is a year. And I, I guess that's where um, that idea that you're getting all this real time feedback and you can tack accordingly if need be, right? Yeah, and 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 that point about a month in D 2 C, but like being a year in retail. And the reason the other the other um, point of me writing that was because the D 2 C um, landscape is evolving so quickly. When I started writing the book, it was the end of twenty nineteen uh, and start of twenty twenty. That's before the pandemic hit, right? And you know, thought about D 2 C, and actually there was a lot of comment commentary um, around D 2 C at that time, saying, "Oh, D 2 C is not really working. It's a, you know, it's not the right way to sell products. You can't make a profitable D 2 C company." Blah blah blah. We're all very anti D 2 C. And then the pandemic hit, and then e commerce went through the roof, and it's like. Okay, so it's even one thing or the other, and so, but and I guess the question was, you know, during the the uh, the course of the pandemic, which hopefully we're you know we've we've come out the other side of now, is actually is D to C only really useful when you've got an event like that, or actually what part does D to C play in the actual the overall um, sales channel and marketing mix, and and where we get to, I think, is D to C is here to stay. And it's really important. Um, however, you have to think about what it means for your brand and your and the customers you're trying to serve. Well, another thing too, when you're busy creating a community, I mean, I, I'm I'm head of content here at, at Coveo, and you know, it's like running a publishing company. I mean, you're you're creating content and podcasts and whatever. These D 2 C brands have to do the same thing. You having constant content going out there. I'm I. I I dance. Um, I just bought a, a new pair of shoes. I've never tried them on, bought them D to C. There's nothing. So who knows? Maybe it'll work. Maybe they won't. But what they get you with is they show the different styles of dance. I mean, and it's it's a lot, a lot of content that's coming down the pipe at me on a regular basis. I only bought them a week ago and I've probably gotten like, you know, 30 alerts for things to do. It's, you, you've got to open up a publishing arm or a media arm as well. I mean, there's a lot of pressure on a D to C to be doing all of this stuff um, exceedingly well. Now, maybe it changes when you're a specialty brand with only a couple products, and then you can focus more on all of this content than if you have a whole co catalog and you want to have a, a community. Maybe maybe you've seen something along those lines. I'm just speculating. No, and content <laughs> is really important. So what's what's happened? And yeah, this is um, this has become more and more important. So D to C one point zero. This is you know sort of nineteen ninety two to uh, sorry um, sort of twenty twelve uh, to twenty twenty. Yeah, think of like Dollar Shave Club and you know brands like this. You know the real you know, Casper mattresses, the re the real innovators on, on D to C. They they were doing it uh, before everyone else. And but what they were finding it was it was great for them because. The cost of doing social digital ads um, was really low um, because not everyone was doing it, and there wasn't a lot of competition there. So it meant if they could get a nice ad to appear on your on your Facebook feed, um, you know, there's a good chance you're going to click on it. Uh, and I think you know, I got a, um, a a quote from one of one of the founders from Casper, and I forget which year it is. It's probably you know year you know, one, two, three after they launched and said, you know, for every dollar they were spending on Facebook, they were getting eight dollars in return. And this was this this and this was this cycle where, you know, every D to C brand is like, let's just pump more and more money we can into social ads um, because we're going to get more money out the other side. It was that you know it was a money making machine. Uh Again, in the UK, one of the um, there was a there's a business called Cornerstone, who were like the UK equivalent of Dollar Shave Club, and he said, you know, back in 2014, 2015, it felt like to him that he should remortgage his house and just spend all that money on Facebook ads because it was just a really good return on investment. However, what happened um, towards the end of 
um, say 2017, 2018, is that Facebook put all their uh, put all their prices up. Well, you know, Meta now it wasn't it was then Facebook. They put up all their prices up. But not only because they uh, they thought, oh, we can make a bit more money by charging a bit more. It's because there was more and more competition. That you know that digital real estate was in such demand, and so it just kept pushing the price and price of these ads up. And it's still they're still going up today. I mean, it's um, it's pretty crazy. But what that's meant for a brand, right? So a brand can't get a great return by just putting ads on. Instagram uh, or Facebook or you know today even even TikTok. I mean TikTok. You, um, I know the brands get a slightly better return, but it's even so, you can't just put adverts up. So what they've got to do instead, this is quite old school. They've got to build a brand, and they build a brand around making sure they can help their consumers, and consumers are aware of them, uh, and they do that by content. Uh, and and across all the different channels, I mean, content is great because you can you, you can spit it out via your social channels on your website and newsletters and various different things you can do. Uh, but they still have to do the old brand building stuff and make sure word of mouth is good, PR is good. They look great all the time. Try to do events, trying to get into stores, all the things. In, that influencers. Do. Influence. Oh, it's it's so many, and it's and it's really hard now. Actually, if you're you know you're running marketing. Uh, um, campaigns for a DTC company. It's like, what do you spend your money on? Because there's so many different channels you have to do. But, you know, I guess you have to do it. You have to do across the board because you've got to build your brand and make sure you're driving awareness, trust, and credibility. Profit. Profit. Let's talk profits because a lot of these uh, brands that you spoke with, a lot of brands that are out there, um, you can't necessarily do the Amazon model of have, you know, deep investors or you have... Uh, AWS uh, funding your your uh, losses in, in retail. So, how are these companies focused on on brand? You've got you've got to do a lot of promotion, as you just said. Uh, are they discounting as much as they used to? Are they trying to stay away from discounting? What are they doing? Yeah, it doesn't make no. You're right. I mean, why can't we all be like Amazon? That's uh, that is the way forward. But I guess we can't. So what do you do instead? I mean, profit, I mean, all businesses have to make profit. Mm -hmm. And um, again, what happened sort of five years ago, every, all the, especially all the VC space, all got quite excited about D2C and let's just plow money in, grow these businesses and, you know, eventually they become profitable and really valuable. Um, the reality is um, that if you just plow money into into, again, it's like sort of digital ads. Um, you're probably not going to get that return. So no matter, no matter how much you put in now, you're not going to get the same out the other side. So you have to be more considered um, in terms of brand building. And those um, the brands that get or the DTC companies that get this right, I think they are a lot less bullish than they used to be in terms of you know what's their lifetime value. You know what's the frequency our customers are going to come back. Uh, you know how much are they going to spend on our store and what and what you get is um i think you just get just more considered marketing decisions and pricing as well because if you know if you're trying to offer a low price but you've got no margin to pay for your marketing your product development and your people again you're just not going to last very long so um i think the world has changed but for a d2c brand you know, getting those unit economics right very quickly, or even, you know, they have to do it from the get-go. If they haven't got their unit economic model right um, and they're relying on, oh, we're going to be able to improve margins in the future, or we think our lifetime value is much, much higher than reasonable, um, yeah, they're not going to stick around for very long. They're the ones who are not going to make money and give d to see a bad name. When um, we were joking when you first came on about, you know, what you might have been buying when the pandemic first started and I was scrolling on Instagram and, you know, and nothing else to do. So I'd just be buying stuff, nasty websites because people were throwing things up quickly. Uh, how much are consumers accepting that, you know, it was like it wasn't even web one, right? It was just like you couldn't find really, but it was intriguing. So you wanted to you wanted to buy and you you struggled to buy it. How much are, are consumers tolerating bad websites now? They're not. And the, the, what's happened, uh, yeah, in, in my opinion, is that D, there's so many really good DTC companies and DTC offers out there. You know, why would you, you know, us as a consumer, why would we accept anything that doesn't look like it's going to give us really good value? Or we can trust that, you know, the, that provider to look after us if things don't go right. If we if we order a product and it doesn't arrive, 
what's going to happen if we order a product and it's not what what we thought it was what's going to happen we order a product and we have it at home and we use it for a month is it going to break yeah all of these things that i i think in the past um you know you might have said oh that's okay um but now you know d2c businesses to survive they've got again it's one of the things they've got to get customer service spot on they've got to have their website looking like you know this is a real thing it's really credible and i can trust them otherwise yeah as a consumer i think we've just got better choices i don't know if you have this uh information but uh it it hit me returns are killing retailers are returns as big a problem in d to c or have you built a different relationship that they're not seeing this the, the amount of returns that's happening in the with retail. It, it depends on the um on on the brand. It depends, you know, on the type of customers. But the ones who really do suffer in this is um the clothing brands. Yeah. So the clothing brands want to have that uh, you know the same sort of experience you have in store when you can try on you know half a dozen outfits and they can pick the one you like and that's the one you buy. So you know, they've they've gone into this crazy model where um, you know you can order six things and send five back, unless you properly build in you know all your logistics logistics costs and you know the cost of returns and handling those products and can you resell them can you not unless you get that right yeah you're you're not going to be able to have a have a very a very good business so I think returns are a real thing but I think it's a job you know you know us as brands to be able to help customers get what they want so whether that is like a sizing guide or you know a feature guide or you know you mentioned your dance shoes you know does that website guide you to and this is the exact product that you need so you don't have to worry about sending it back i think you know brands need to do all of that and also you know encourage the the, the consumer to think think twice and not you know do i really need to is it is it really cool and ethical and cost effective um to all the stuff that i don't need because i can i send it back i think there is going to be a change there so so we'll see so it's it's just another model but then again some people are always going to want to physically touch and feel and look at the product before they buy and this is why multi-channel is so important so if you recognize that some of your customers have got that need you need to send them to store it could be your own stores it could be a you know a third party reseller whoever but you need to cater for those customers without um, creating this crazy transaction where customers order stuff they and they don't like it and they have to package it all up and send it back i mean that's just a real pain yeah, we we do uh we do many different uh, consumer surveys throughout the year. We just did the holiday guide, and uh, we were we, uh, luxury goods. Luxury goods are something people want to touch it. You're going to spend that much money. You want to know what it is you're getting. Is it the right quality? Because you know it's special. It's a something. It's a something special that you want to want to make a purchase about. What I, I'm loving this conversation. I know you've got another meeting you have to run to. So just. Can you tell us about some of the characteristics or what what some of the um, different are there are there some things that characteristics people should think keep in mind when they're building a, a great D 2 C brand or maybe they're in the D 2 C market and they're trying to make it even better is there a checklist of sorts some sort of summary of ideas that you uh, would uh, be able to pull from all of the interviews you did. Yeah, there is. And this is what I try to do, um, I guess, in summing up in my book. Um, there are sort of shared characteristics. I mean, first of all, it comes to, you know, the product. Have they got a good enough product? Is there a product market fit? This this is it. You can have the best D2C strategy in the world, but if your product's not actually serving a need, um, then it's not going to work. But beyond that, you know, it's about um, building community, you know, having a brand with a purpose. And the reason the brand has to have a purpose because that's the connection with the customer. The customer, because, because the customer's got so many choices, you know, whatever you're selling, whether it's tennis racket or dance shoes or whatever else, there's, you know, the internet is amazing, isn't it? You know, there's just so many options. So it's about that that shared connection in terms of purpose and values. You've got to convey that to the um, to the end customer because if they, again, if they agree with you, if they share the same values, you're going to be um, the, the brand that they're going to want to interact with again and again. Um, so, and then, then beyond that, I mean, digital, 
digital is moving so fast. It's a it's a platform that we have the opportunity to try out different things. It's about innovation. You can get this really quick feedback cycle, so you can you can do loads loads of innovation without breaking the bank. It's not like in the old days when you had you know your pro, you know, your product development team would spend five years on a product and they'd get it out to store, and then two years later they work out, oh actually that wasn't quite right. You can you can do it in 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 weeks, months, or even days. And I think all the best DTC brands use the um, that instant feedback to get um, to help them make the right product decisions to make what they've got better, and introduce new stuff. And if the new stuff they introduce doesn't work, they can quickly um, pull back on it before it hurts the business too much. The other thing that uh, I think all the um, all the DTC brands just do really well is just think about how they best serve the customers and this is why um you know that is customer experience is really important but also things like you know uh, again i mentioned cornerstone who um who did the um uh, who were the uk equivalent of dollar shave club one of the things they did a few years ago which actually um stopped it being a subscription only business because what they realized was that subscription only was actually causing more stress and tension with some of their customers um, than it would be if they just um, bought you know, the products when they wanted them. I mean, subscription is all about making your life easy. I'm sure we all have subscription brands that we, we sign up to. But if your subscription is like, you know, if if it's causing you stress, it's like, oh, do I really need this product? Um, and you get it, and it, if it's delivered to you and you don't need it, I mean, that's that's not very good. And and what they also realize, like with Amazon Prime, next day delivery, it's so easy for everyone to actually get quick deliveries. So they wanted to provide more options. So better ser- better service to customers. And that better service to customers also leads you on to multi-channel because it's like, yeah, we can't serve all customers via our website. How can we serve customers who won't purchase our website but still want our products? How do we look after those guys? And that leads you into multi-channel. So what's the next book going to be about? We will see. I'm. Uh, I'm really. I'm not a writer. I'm an entrepreneur. So did a heck of a job. That was that, a really, really good read. I mean, it's compelling. It's fun. Um, it's informative. It, you know everything. But maybe it was because you were taking all this in and you were really interested in the subject. Maybe that's yeah, no. I, I, I loved it. I loved it because it, it, it was. I was. I was really into the subject. And the reason I wrote the book is because I wanted to learn and I wanted to help others. It was. The, it was the book that I wanted while I was doing all the DTC in my last business. So what I'm trying to do now, I'm actually trying to launch a new DTC brand. Um, so I'm taking all the learnings that I had from my last business, the book, and trying to put that into a new business. So so watch this space. Um, I'm just kicking it off. So um, uh, yeah, I'm just trying to put together a plan. I'm trying to encourage investors. So any investors who... Um, you see, come and come and look at. I might have something good to show you. So I'm just ready to start again, and I'm so excited about that because I learned so much in the process of writing the book. It's going to be so much fun to put those learnings into action. Now, now you have me totally intrigued, uh, Mike Stevens, the author of the Direct to Consumer Playbook. I hope you come back. I want to hear all about uh, uh, the new brand that you're going to launch. Yeah, me too. I'll come back anytime. I'd love to tell you about it. All right. Thank you so much. You're listening to the Ecom Edge brought to you by Covey, and I'm your host, Diane Burley. Join us uh, again and uh, join. you can subscribe on any one of your favorite podcast channels. Thank you.